everyone. Uh, welcome to Professor uh, Hilby's uh, professorial chair lecture on a general theory of church and state, a secularist view. Uh, before he gives us his lecture, um, I'll make a short introduction of Professor Hilby. I am sure you all know him. Um, uh, Professor Hil Hilby is the director of the Institute of Government and Law Reform. He is an associate professor of law at the UP College of Law, where he teaches constitutional law and philosophy, philosophy of law with emphasis on issues relating to church and state, post-colonial constitutionalism, and the relationship between the information environment and legal consciousness. He is also the editor-in-chief of the Philippine Law and Society Review, a peer-reviewed publication that examines the intersection between law and other social disciplines. His interest in public law is supplemented by experience in public institutions. He was law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Vicente Mendoza, an associate solicitor at the Office of the Solicitor General, on secondment as assistant to Sol Solicitor General Simeon Marcelo, and a consultant to the Commission on Elections. He also serves as vice chair of Bantay Kataruman, or Sentinels of Justice, a civic organization formed by Jovito R. Salonga to address issues of public injustice and oversee the appointments process in the judiciary. He was a Ful Fulbright visiting scholar at Boston College in 2001 and finished his LLM at Yale Law School in 2005. He earned his LLB at the University of the Philippines in 1999 and his AB at the University of Santo Tomas in 1995. He has also held fellowships at the Asian Law Institute at the National University of Singapore, Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law in Heidelberg, and Sidiman University. Professor Hilby has published articles on constitutional theory, philosophy of adjudication, legal hermeneutics, the bar exams, the liberal consciousness, the print culture and the emergence of the discourse of rights, the institution of marriage, free speech, presidential immunity, and the problem of church and state. His collected works, Unplugging the Constitution, was published by the UP Press in 2009. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let us all give a warm round of applause to our beloved boss at the IGLR, <laughs> Professor Perry <laughs> Hilton. Constitutional law this afternoon, and only them, right? Uh, uh, but it appears there's some interest in what I have to say. Uh, well, again, thank you for having the the time, the the inclination, and uh, perhaps even the the courage to come over uh, on a very windy afternoon. Uh, it's it's a very different school experience for a, a scholar to come face to face with an audience. Uh, the 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 experience of uh, working as a scholar makes makes someone feel really detached from one's audience. The audience is usually in the form of a student or or a philosopher or anyone interested in your work, uh, reading your work in the library, in the comfort of uh, uh, a, a room. And so there's no personal engagement with uh, the audience. And so the, the lecture format allows the, the scholar Right, uh, that unique opportunity to come face to face with the audience and have access to uh, expressions and reactions, which, which can be a very terrifying experience for some, and also a wonderful opportunity for uh, for others. Let me begin with the objective of uh, the theory. Uh, it is to to present a rationally justifiable, comprehensive understanding of the relationship between church and state. 
I think today we suffer from you know, the lack of a general framework for understanding the abstract relationship among the various clauses, uh, which prevents lawyers, judges, and advocates from adjudicating concrete cases and controversies uh, from a secularist perspective. Uh, recent developments in uh, Philippine society and Philippine law uh, have made it almost mandatory for us to uh, develop a general framework uh, that can unite all the clauses uh, under a coherent scheme of understanding. And so for this afternoon, that is what I'm going to uh, attempt. Right. Uh, let me proceed with the characteristics of this particular general theory. Right. Uh, okay. It offers a tight correlation among text, history, and structure of the Constitution in a simple uh, yet efficient manner. Uh, it is basically a theory of interpretation, one that should affect the way we view doctrine. Uh, and so it is a theory of interpretation from a, an internalist and doctrinal standpoint. Uh, it must provide a determinate, if not, sorry, determinable, if not determinate, answers to all questions of church and state in a consistent and logical manner. Uh, the theory, if followed, will substantially reduce uncertainty in interpretation. It is factually grounded and rationally defensible. Um, claims about the text, history, and structure are either factual or acceptable to interpreters with open minds. It also offers a sustained critique of alternative views about church and state. Uh, so far as I know, there is no other general framework for understanding all the clauses. But what we do have, I think, are ideas about how to understand uh, the various clauses. And these ideas have been more or less articulated uh, quite fully by Justice Puno in the case of Estrada versus Espitor and Father Bernas in uh, both in his uh, textbook as well as in his uh, Philippine Daily Inquirer uh, column. Uh, it offers what I consider the best possible way to unite all the church and state clauses of the Constitution uh, from a secularist perspective. It is a general theory, uh, meaning that it seeks to understand all the clauses right, uh, and provide the answers to all possible questions of uh, church and state. Uh, finally, it is a descriptive theory, not a normative theory. Uh, by this, I mean I am just offering you the gun. I'm not telling you to shoot it. Right. Uh, it provides only for the limits of the possible, uh, the limits of what can be done given the following constraints of text, history, and, and structure. Okay. Uh, let me distinguish between secularism as a normative goal, secularism proper, and the normative goals of secularism. Okay. Secularism as a normative goal has already been achieved because secularism as a constitutional principle already appears in our constitution. And so the fight for secularism as a formal constitutional guarantee is over. For that, you will have to thank um, the Ilustrados, uh, those who fought the Philippine Revolution, and those who innocently what, uh, placed into our constitution in 1986 uh, the secularism principle in Article 2 of the constitution from its former position in the 1970 constitution. And so the goal is simply to provide uh, the tools by which we can operationalize the principle of secularism. Uh, and so I'm concerned more with uh, how to implement the details of this constitutional principle that we have in Article 2. Okay. Uh, what is secularism? As, uh, as a purely descriptive matter, right? Uh, it is the separation of church and state, although I don't think you'll be very happy with uh, this particular answer. Uh, uh, I define secularism as a process uh, that has two components. Number one, 
It is the process of reducing religious influence in political institutions. And number two, it is the process of privileging reason in the consideration and critique of public policy. I think these are dynamic and incremental. Uh, secularism is a dynamic and incremental movement towards greater and greater secularization. Uh, it is a progress towards what I consider functional secularization. Uh, these standards are easily comprehensible standards and can be implemented by judges, lawyers, and used by advocates. Let me proceed to uh, the religion clauses. These are all the religion clauses in the Constitution. Uh, by religion clauses, I refer to the clauses that specifically refer to God or religion. There are other clauses in the Constitution that we may consider religiously motivated. Uh, the, a specific example would be um, Article 2, Section 12, right, uh, on the uh, protection of the life of the unborn from conception. Uh, they need not be read as a, as a religion clause, although I can offer, right, uh, based on the theory, uh, a secularist understanding of that particular clause as well. Okay. Uh, let me just read to you the various clauses. Uh, the preamble, uh, we, the sovereign Filipino people, imploring the aid of Almighty God in order to build a just and humane society and establish a government that shall embody our ideals and aspirations, promote common good, etc., to ordain and promulgate this constitution. Uh, it might interest you to know that the Malolos Constitution, which also has a, a preambular clause, refers not to an almighty God, but the ultimate lawgiver of the universe. Uh, it speaks in terms of uh, the Enlightenment code word for a deist God. You know, someone who is not a personal God, someone who doesn't participate in uh, everyday affairs, someone who doesn't answer personal prayers, but someone who just created the universe and then became an absentee uh, god. Uh, you also have what I consider the most important clause in all of the religion clauses. Oh, sorry. Uh, Article 2, Section 6. The separation of church and state shall be inviolable. Article 3 of the Bill of Rights, no law shall be made respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination or preference shall forever be allowed. No religious test shall be required for the exercise of civil or political rights. The text of Article 3, Section 5 is the culmination of almost a century of development, beginning with uh, the Philippine Bill of 1902, actually with uh, President McKinley's instructions to the first Philippine Commission. But, uh, it was minimized into a single line in the Philippine Bill of 1902. It was expanded in the Jones Law of 1916 and uh, basically retained its current form. You also have, uh, not a lot of people consider this as a religious clause, but I think it is a, uh, it is a very important religious clause. Article 6, Section 5, Paragraph 2, on the participation of uh, the religious sector in the party list. The party list representative shall constitute 20 percentum of the total number of representatives, including those under the party list, for three consecutive terms under uh, after the ratification of this constitution, one half of the seats allocated to the party lists representative shall be filled as provided by law by the selection or election from the labor, peasant, urban, poor, indigenous cultural communities, women, youth, and such other sectors as may be provided by law, except the religious uh, sector. The Party List Act actually implements this provision of the constitution by barring the religious sector from participating in the party list system. Uh, Article 6, Section 28, Paragraph 3. Charitable institutions, churches, and parsonages or convents according to the mosques, nonprofit cemeteries, and all lands, buildings, and improvements 
actually directly and exclusively used for religious, charitable, or educational purposes shall be exempt from taxation. You also have Article 6, Section 29, Paragraph 2. Uh, no public money or property shall be appropriated, applied, paid, employed directly or indirectly for the use, benefit, support of any sect, church, domination, sectarian institution, or system of religion, or any other priest, preacher, minister, other religious teacher, or dignitary as such, except when such priest, preacher, minister, or dignitary is assigned to the armed forces, or to any penal institution or government orphanage or depresarium. You also have the General Provisions Article 14, Section, par uh, section 3, Paragraph 3, uh, which was inserted specifically by the group of Father Bernas. At the option expressed in writing by the parents or guardians, religion shall be allowed to be taught to their children or wards in public elementary and high schools within regular class hours by instructors designated or approved by the religious authorities of the religion to which the children or wards belong without additional cost to the government. Uh, just like Article 2, Section 12 of the Constitution, uh, this was really meant to preempt in the filing of um, a case, uh, the type of case that has been litigated um, many times in the United States, uh, what they refer to as the, uh, uh, the closed time period, uh, a period where public school children are taught by the, uh, uh, the members of their parents' faith. Right? Uh, uh, the decision of the Supreme Court has, United States Supreme Court, has actually wobbled on, on this particular question. Uh, but with the uh, insertion in the Philippine Constitution of this particular uh, clause, uh, that particular litigation can no longer be uh, done here in the Philippines. You also have Article 14, uh, Section 4, Paragraph 2, on the uh, uh, privileges of religious institutions uh, that are owned by foreigners. Educational institutions other than those established by religious groups and mission boards shall be owned solely by citizens of the Philippines or corporations or associations at least 60% of the capital of which is owned by such citizens. Uh, and then the final clause, Article 15, Section 3, Paragraph 1, the state shall defend the right of spouses to found a family in accordance with their religious convictions and the demands of responsible parenthood. Uh, those are all the religion clauses. Uh, the challenge for someone who is trying to unify all these clauses is actually simple, right? Uh, how to organize the clauses through a consistent hierarchy of values based on a justifiable scale of preferences. And so my goal is to try to unify all the clauses by creating a hierarchy and justifying that particular hierarchy through a set of preferences. Uh, this basically is uh, the theory. Uh, the theory asks as it appears to you, uh, is actually quite quite simple and efficient, and I would say even elegant, but that's just me. Right? Uh, uh, it begins with uh, what I would consider a fundamental organizing principle, uh, the one principle that rules them all, right? Uh, uh, the secularism principle. Uh, it is followed by uh, prohibitory norms. Uh, these are negative norms that implement. Right? Uh, the secularism principle uh, uh, on the participation of the religious in the finalist system and the use of public funds by the religious, uh, religious organizations and those who belong to religious organizations. Uh, uh, next in line would be what I consider the rights-based norm. Uh, this is a scheme for regulating rights. Uh, they, are not they are not prohibitory in character. Uh, they are actually regulatory in character, meaning that in some cases, the state gives in to religious freedom, while in some cases, uh, the state imposes uh, certain prohibitions on 
uh, the state. And then I proceed with what I, what Kelsen would refer to as permissive norms. Uh, permissive norms are actually exceptions to the secularism principle. And because they are exceptions to the secularism principle, they have to be strictly construed. Uh, last in the list would be uh, the preamble to the Constitution. Uh, people have always asked, you know, how can you possibly have a strong secularism principle in a country, you know, with a preamble that recognizes the existence of God? My answer is that the preamble is a non-normative clause. Right? Uh, it's not a source of right, and therefore, in the hierarchy. Right, that, that I, I have before you, right, uh, it, it occupies the, the lowest rank. Right, uh, and so I would be actually generally dismissive uh, of the preamble. Uh, in fact, if you look at the, the text of the preamble, it's simply declaratory. We, the sovereign Filipino people, do ordain this constitution. And so that takes care of uh, the preamble. Right? Uh, secularism under the Constitution is an organizing principle. Uh, it is a fundamental norm that has the greatest weight uh, and occupies the highest preference in the menu of norms found in uh, the Constitution. How do I justify right, uh, this hierarchy? Uh, I justify this hierarchy by using the three tools of interpretation, uh, the text, the history, and the structure of the Constitution. Let me begin with uh, an exegesis of the text. Uh, you have, if you, uh, Title Three of the Malolos Constitution. Uh, Dean Pangalangan and I have actually written uh, in the same PLJ article, uh, edited by by our three new colleagues in the faculty. Uh, Bowie Season was editor in chief at the time, and his uh, his editors, uh, both Johanko and Emerson Bynes. Right? Uh, we actually wrote. Right, uh, about the history of the drafting of this particular provision in, uh, in the Malolos Constitution. Uh, if you look at the development of the secularism principle, uh, what you will see actually is a resurgence of this principle in the 1987 Constitution. Uh, this principle, right, uh, the principle of secularism, appears only twice in our constitutional history. Right, uh, first in the Malolos Constitution, and then in the 1987, oh sorry, also in the 1970, and then in the 1987 Constitution. In the 1973 Constitution, it appeared as part of the general provisions, right, uh, not as part of the uh, fundamental principle of the Constitution. So you begin with the Malolos Constitution. The state recognizes the freedom and equality of all beliefs as well as the separation of church and state. Uh, if you study the history of the drafting of Title III, you would see that uh, Title III, well, if you had asked me whether Title III had any chance of being you know, passed in the Malolos Congress, I'd say no chance at all. In fact, the debate was for the establishment of a national church. Uh, the, the secular Filipino priests were uh, big, one of the biggest stakeholders in the Philippine Revolution, because they're the ones who, who did a lot of, who made a lot of sacrifices early on. Right? Uh, they were, uh, I would consider the first Filipino intelligentsia, the, uh, the, the secular Filipino priest. Right? Uh, and so, for uh, the intellectual elites in the Malolos Congress to be able to win this book right, uh, was really a big win for uh, secularism. And then you proceed with McKinley's instructions. Uh, the separation between the state and the church shall be real, entire, and absolute. Right? Uh, McKinley refers to this clause as uh, a byproduct of the Treaty of Paris. But I looked it up, I checked the Treaty of Paris, and there is no clause right, uh, that is similar to this. Other than that, religious freedom shall be guaranteed. Uh, I am making this distinction because part of the theory includes right, uh, uh, a distinction of the Article 3 rights and the Article 2 rights. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain that later. In the Philippine Bill of 1902, there is no principle of secularism. What you have is 
uh, the non-establishment clause, as well as the freedom of exercise clause. In the Philippine Bill of 1916, there is no secularism principle. Again, what you have is uh, the non-establishment and the free exercise clause. Same thing with the 1935 Constitution. In the, 19, in the 1973 Constitution, they inserted in the general provisions a secularism uh, clause. But it's not a secularism principle because it doesn't appear in, uh, in, in Article 2 of that Constitution. And then you have Article 2, Section 6, the 1987 Constitution, the separation of church and state shall be inviolable. Uh, I, I, I looked at the history of the, uh, the cause of the, play, the movement of this particular clause from the general provisions in the 1973 Constitution uh, to Article 2 of the present Constitution. There is no debate on why they did that. Uh, even Justice Puna acknowledges that, right, uh, that there was no debate when they decided to, uh, to, to move the secularism clause and change it from a secularism clause to a secularism principle. The point that I'm trying to make simply is this. Right, uh, if you analyze simply the text, you know, uh, purely from the standpoint of uh, textual exegesis, uh, you will see a resurgence of the secularism principle uh, uh, and a return to its status under the Malolos Constitution. And then I go to history. The question here is, for whose benefit do we build uh, the wall of separation? Uh, it is easy to make the argument that the the secularism principle protects what, uh, what the biologist Stephen Jay Gould referred to as a, a non-overlapping magisterium. Right? Uh, the secularism principle erects a wall right, uh, and makes them good neighbors, basically, the church and the state. Uh, but that is actually very difficult to, to implement uh, because when it comes to actual cases and controversies, you will have to tilt the balance, whether it's in favor of the church or in favor of uh, the state. And so the claim that I make is that at the level of details, right, uh, at the level of actual cases and controversies, the concept of a non-overlapping magisterium, uh, it's just uh, impossible to, to implement. And so you have to answer at some point uh, this next question. Is the principle of secularism meant to protect the church from the state or the state from the church? There is an answer encoded in Philippine jurisprudence. Like, uh, the answer was given to us by uh, Chief Justice Puno in Estrada versus Escobar. You know, the good thing about Chief Justice Puno is that he, he tries so much to articulate all the basis of his decisions. And you get a sense of, you know, uh, the kind of motivation he has when it comes to adjudicating, uh, sorry, adjudicating cases. We proceed to what I call the curious case of Estrada versus Escobar and the problem of benevolent neutrality. Uh, let me give you the basic facts of Estrada versus Escobar. Uh, Escobar, I suppose, is still was a court interpreter in the RTC of Las Piñas. Um, a case was filed against her by a total stranger, uh, Alejandro Estrada. And the case was for violation of the civil service rules, right, uh, grounds for disciplinary action, right, uh, gross and immoral conduct. Right, uh, and the basis of the charge was that she was living with a man who was not her husband. Right, uh, at first, Escritor denied the charge, but eventually she admitted to the charge. And she said she is living with, she has been living for about 20 years now with a guy named Kilapio. Right, uh, and that she used to be married, right, uh, but her husband left her. Right, uh, and she fell in love with this guy, Kilapio, who, al who also turned out to be married. Right, uh, and so by the time of the litigation, uh, Kilapio was still married. Uh, her husband, Estrada's husband, sorry, Escritor's husband, was already dead, and so if you look at it from a purely uh, penal code standpoint, 
uh, she had committed to the bigamy or concubinage. Uh, admitting to the charge, she said, as a way of avoiding uh, the disciplinary uh, penalty or the sanction, uh, she executed with her uh, with her partner a document called uh, Declaration Pledging Faithfulness. They said they were members of the Jehovah's Witness um, Bible Watchtower Group. Uh, and this Declaration Pledging Faithfulness uh, is a document where the elders of her faith or their faith right, uh, validate their union. Apparently, this declaration pledging faithfulness is executed by the Jehovah's Witness only in cases where there is a legal um, uh, impediment to, to an otherwise moral union according to the doctrines of their faith. The decision. The decision was a close majority for Justice Puno with dissenting opinions from Justice Carvio, Inares Santiago, uh, Carvio Morales, and, and some other justices. But in Estrada versus Escrito, where a majority of the members of the court led by Justice Puno held that you know, uh, uh, the Declaration Pledging Faithfulness right, uh, is evidence of the free exercise of her faith. Uh, and because it's evidence of her free exercise of her faith, right, uh, the state has the burden uh, uh, to justify why it is encroaching on the free exercise of uh, her faith. Uh, Justice Puro justified you know, uh, the shifting of the burden from escritor to the state by saying that, uh, by adopting what he referred to uh, based on, you know, uh, American jurisprudence, like a, a theory of benevolent neutrality accommodation. Like a, applying benevolent neutrality accommodation, Justice Puno said, the state must be able to comply with what is akin to strict standards of constitutional scrutiny. Like a, and because the state was not able to comply with those standards, uh, Escritor was uh, let go. Like a, she was acquitted of the charge. What is important for me is the operative assumption of the adoption for the adoption of benevolent neutrality accommodation. And this is just a spoonless reading of uh, the history of the secularism clauses. According to Justice Puro, the secularism clauses are meant not to protect the state from the church, but to protect the church from the state. Right? Uh, and for me, that is very important. And because the clauses were meant to protect uh, the church from state intrusion, like that, any exercise under the free exercise clause would have to be, right, uh, uh, any intrusion by the state right, uh, under the free exercise clause would have to be specially justified uh, by the state. Okay. Uh, I disagree with the majority of the court on, on two main grounds. Uh, number one, uh, benevolent neutrality accommodation is, as a term, internally inconsistent. Right? Uh, you cannot be neutral and be benevolently accommodationist. Right? Uh, it's, it's just impossible, purely on uh, an analytical grounds. Uh, this is because neutrality is the language of impartiality. Uh, benevolent accommodation is the language of partiality. More importantly, I think benevolent neutrality accommodation runs against uh, the history of Philippine society. And so instead of a model that views secularism or the principle of secularism as meant to protect the church from the state, I offer a reversal uh, of that particular view. Uh, the secularism principle should be viewed as a principle that is meant to protect the state from the church. And I think if you've read enough of Philippine history, uh, that particular view is rather easy to justify. Right? Uh, regardless of the aims of secularism in the, other, in the United States or in any other country, uh, I think our own history shows that the goal of separation was and has always been right? uh, the protection of the state from the influence of organized religion. Uh, in fact, I will offer a view of Philippine Revolution as a as a fight for secularism more than anything else, as a battle for the creation of a public space. Uh, the Philippine Revolution against Spain can be viewed 
not only as a struggle for independence from a foreign power, uh, but more importantly, a struggle for the establishment of a secular Philippine Republic. Uh, the revolutionaries were not atheists. Uh, they were not even deists, right? Uh, only the intellectuals were, were deists. But they, they saw the real problems engendered by the absence of a separation between church and state, the kinds of conflicts of interest that are created by uh, non-separation. And so the early Filipinos saw secularism as an important component of democracy. Obviously, they viewed secularism as protective of the state more than it was protective of the church. I see no reason why today we should differ from that view. Also, viewing secularism as state protective rather than church protective, I think is the culmination of a process that has taken Philippine state a century and a half to accomplish. And, uh, this narrative begins with young Filipinos like Rizal uh, who went to Europe and, uh, and understood the impact of the Enlightenment and brought home the tools with which to offer a sustained critique of the colonial administration held captive by organized religion. Uh, their critique inspired fellow Filipinos to wage a war of independence, the enduring project of which was the Malolos Constitution. Uh, many scholars, uh, Justice Puno, even Justice Mendoza, are actually quite dismissive of the Malolos Constitution, if only on the ground that it was never enforced. Uh, but I would look at the Malolos Constitution as uh, a, a source of uh, one of the purest insights about the ideals of the Philippine uh, Revolution. And looking at the Malolos Constitution, I would consider as its most important provision its secularism principle. Uh, secularism also as a historical problem is simply a part of a larger problem of state capture in Philippine society state captured by entrenched elites, those with famous surnames, economic elites, those with large bank accounts, warlords, those with guns and goons, national and multinational corporations, those with large expense accounts, and the church, those with large cultural capital. Secularism, therefore, is the process of eliminating the barriers to democratic rule and participation. Uh, let me now go back to uh, the theory. Right. Uh, uh, I would consider the principle of secularism as uh, an organizing principle, the consequences of which are as follows. Right. Uh, as a first principle, it ranks higher than all the other provisions of the Constitution related to church and state. As a first principle, uh, a longer working in lines, it is also a tool of interpretation to be used in the resolution of unclear cases or cases that are susceptible to various interpretation. Therefore, in case of doubt, right, uh, the principle of secularism mandates that the decision should be in favor of, number one, the reduced influence of organized religion in the affairs of the state, number two, the privileging of rational over non-rational justification. Uh, this, I think, are powerful interpretive tools that tilt the balance in favor of secularism in unclear cases. These are basic tools, I think, that are very easy to implement on the part of judges, uh, judges very easy to use on the part of lawyers and, and advocates. Right? Uh, going back, let me now try to apply right, uh, the theory. In the case of SP4, uh, what are the ways by which you can uh, decide uh, the case of f You can deal, number one, with the question of uh, what are the ways by which you can decide the, the decision, uh, the case of s discounting all the religious arguments made by Justice Buddha. Number one, you can go after the question of standing. You can impose a question of uh, a burden of standing on the part of Estrada and say because he was not a party to uh, the affair, he had no right to sue. This, after all, is a private crime. Right? Uh, so that takes care of the entire case. Uh, Escritor you know, is also acquitted of the charge. You can also impose a nexus requirement between her job and the charge for which 
uh, the case was being heard. Right? Uh, she is a court interpreter. Right? Uh, what is the relationship between her being a court interpreter and her living with a man, not her husband, or legally married husband? Nothing. Right? And so again, you dismiss the case. You can also go uh, to the other side and convict. Just uh, the way Justice Carpio interpreted the provision. Uh, this is not grossly immoral conduct because uh, 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 based on the declaration pledging faithfulness, right, uh, whatever moral questions uh, we had about the relationship was erased. But, but this is conduct prejudicial to the best interest of uh, uh, the service. And so Justice Carpio would convict right, uh, on, on that ground. I think it's a rationally defensible argument. Uh, you can also go the United Santiago way. Right? Uh, wait, uh, last time I checked, right, uh, the revised penal code penalized concubinage and, uh, and, and bigamy. Right? Uh, These crimes that appear in the revised penal code are following standard theory, mala inse. And because they are mala inse, they are uh, by nature immoral. And therefore, you can also put it on the grounds. And so what you have is a range of options, not entirely determinate, right, uh, that purely discounts uh, all the arguments made by, by Justice Poole. So uh, another important consequence of Article 2 as a first principle is this. It is broader the demands than the demands of Article 3 norms of non-establishment and free exercise laws. Uh, and I think this might be the most important for, for those interested in theory. Article 3 norms are right-based negative norms. Uh, uh, because they appear in, in, uh, in Article 3, couched in a language that is prohibitory. Right? Uh, they're basically uh, uh, instructions on the part of the state to the government, right? uh, not to interfere with free exercise not to establish a church. The placement of article of the principle of secularism, secularism in Article 2, on the other hand, changes the character of that norm from a negative prohibitory norm to a positive norm. And the implication is massive. Right? Uh, as a positive obligation on the part of the state, the state is required to maintain right, uh, a secular environment. I'll give you an example. Right? Uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, if you are going to litigate same-sex marriage along Article 3 lines, you will have to argue that uh, the absence of a same-sex legislation, sorry, uh, that the, the presence of the family code right, uh, and the, the absence of any provision in the family code on same-sex marriage violates equal protection and due process rights. Right, uh, but, if you're going to argue along Article 2 lines, which you can use in conjunction with the Article 3 argument, uh, the argument is, is split right? uh, from one where the state fails right, uh, to uh, recognize equal protection and due process rights, to one where the state, because of its positive obligation to ensure a secular environment, has a legislative obligation to pass a same-sex statute. Right? Uh, this is actually uh, the kind of decision that was rendered by uh, state Supreme Courts in the early stages of the same-sex litigation in the United States. Uh, note that the United States federal constitution, and I'm quite sure also in the state constitutions, in many of the states con state constitutions, do not have a secularism principle. Uh, what the federal constitution has is uh, the negative rights that we find in, in Article 3 of our Constitution, uh, non-establishment and free exercise. Right? Uh, and the early decisions of, I think, Hawaii and uh, another state in, in, in the United States, right? uh, the, the decision of the judges was couched you know, in, in, in this language. Because the state doesn't have a same-sex uh, statute, right? uh, which violates equal protection and due process rights. We are giving the state 60 days to pass a same-sex statute. Right? Uh, and so it's an injunction 
it's a order directed to the state, not to you know just state officials. Right? Uh, to uh, sorry, to the state legislature, not to any executive officer. Right? Uh, pass a same-sex statute. If you don't pass a legislate a same-sex statute, we will recognize as valid right? uh, same-sex marriages. Uh, I think that kind of argument you know falls squarely within an Article Two analysis, uh, which imposes upon the state. Like a, not just a negative duty to respect the rights, the negative rights of its citizens, but a positive obligation to create a secular environment. And, um, uh, uh, I think I'm, I'm done. Right. Uh, uh, I'm really more interested now with your questions, so I can stress test the theory, right, uh, if you have any questions. But the theory is a one-page theory. Uh, it's it's a simple and efficient theory. Uh, but the implications, I think, are are quite massive. Uh, I, I intend to write a book about it. Right. Uh, uh, and this hierarchy, I think, is easily understandable. Right. Uh, even if its theoretical implications are are much much deeper. Any questions? It's actually directed against the hegemonic church, just against the Catholic church, I mean, protecting uh, the state against the, the, the dominant church, or when you use church, does it refer to all, all religions? Because you see, um, maybe the smaller religions actually also need protection from the, from the, dominant, yes. uh, um, from the dominant faith. I have another question, but I'll, okay. I'll leave it at that first. Uh, the way I define secularism as a process, uh, it's actually directed against uh, organized religions and uh, small religions in so far as their right to use uh, religious justifications are, are, are concerned. Right? Uh, I think when it comes to organized religion, your problem is, uh, number one, uh, the use of funding, right? uh, because organized religion will have greater access to state funds than small, less organized religion, right? Uh, and also the use of symbols, right? Uh, more organized religions will have greater access to, uh, uh, greater ability, I would say, to impose their symbols on, on the state, right? Uh, and so, uh, to the extent that I'm concerned about funding and symbols, uh, it is more directed towards organized religion. But because I view secularism as a process, right, uh, of not only of reducing religious influence in uh, in government, a, a, a principle that is directed more towards the organized religion, but also as a process of privileging rational over non-rational justifications. To that extent, it will also be directed against smaller religions. Um, can I have one more question? Yes. Um, how about, how, can we test this theory on the party list groups which front for religious yes. groups, like Buhai yes. fronting for uh, Mike Velarde, or I don't know the party. Buhai, I think even, Eddie maybe Eddie. even, See back, maybe, Spock, yes. maybe, right? Uh, but but more specifically, I think, and more clearly, uh, Uvai. Uvai. Yes. Well, let me start with the the, the caution, right? <laughs> uh, what I provide is the gun, not a justification for using the gun, right? Uh, but in theory, yes, yes. Uh, I think. You can make the argument that because the secularism principle mandates that the state create a secular environment, right? Uh, applying Article 6, Section 5 of the Philippine Constitution and the Partilist Statute, uh, you, the state can disqualify and go after uh, not only the out and out religious organization, but the religious organization that fronts as a secular party list. Uh, the only difference is that you will have to go deeply into the facts, right? Uh, because 
you have to pierce the veil of the, the secular front uh, for you to be able to go into the details of uh, whether or not they are actually a, a religious organization. But yes, I think the theory can, can take care of that and will actually disqualify right, uh, a religious organization uh, with a secular face. Is there any question? Any other question? Yes. Sir, uh, I would just like to ask, what are the implications of such a model, for example, on the Sharia court system being implemented in Mindanao? Yes. Again, it's a gun, not a gun that must be used, right? And so the existence of the power is no justification for its exercise. But if you want to use the gun, I think, uh, um, I think you can subject all the uh, uh, all the privileges and immunities under the Sharia law to a secular analysis. And I think that if you actually do that, that the Sharia law would make it, it would be very difficult for the Sharia law to withstand that kind of a constitutional scrutiny based on a purely secularist uh, standpoint. Thank you, sir. Other questions? We no longer have the power to grade you. You are now our colleagues. Well, actually, I look at uh, those principles, for example, yes. separation of church and state as reflecting, uh, well, not, maybe not a consensus, but what a majority of our uh, citizens view as how it should be interpreted at the time, for example. Uh, well, I mean, that's how we developed our other concepts, like due process or equal protection. But uh, is it, do you agree with the statement that would say that because the constituency or the great majority of Filipinos are religious, uh, then uh, right now, the zeitgeist, or how many would interpret that provision, is consistent with a view that accommodates uh, Justice Puno's views uh, with respect to escritor, or which justifies many of our provisions that, uh, say, uh, you can say, uh, establish uh, canon law or other laws or even Sharia law in our jurisdiction. There's what, what I'm saying is that uh, right now that's how we understand it. Uh, we understand uh, separation of church and state as consistent with the present practice of Sharia laws or whatever. You know. And as long as we are dominantly of uh, a few faiths or I mean uh, then it would still be that way until we we get into a more uh, diverse set of things. Uh, I think that is the view of Justice Puno, right? Uh, I mean, that is at least one view that Justice Puno will agree with. Uh, but but what I would say is that uh, the religious are not really that homogenous in terms of the set intensity of of their beliefs, right? Uh, number two, I think because the Constitution. Uh, uses as a fundamental principle secularism, then I'd say we have pre-committed to a functional uh, secularism, which is a, a, a process. And if you see secularism as a process that leads towards uh, greater and greater secularization, right, uh, then uh, you might be more open to accepting the possibility that Filipinos now more than ever are open to uh, separation of church and state, that they will, in their private lives, 
right, uh, in the private sphere of their activities, uh, they will be religious or as religious as possible. But when it comes to deploying arguments in the public sphere, when it comes to making arguments with public impact, right, uh, they, they are now more willing to do away right, uh, or, or with the religiously motivated argument or the out-and-out -out religious argument. Um, you mentioned, well, since this is a gun we're talking about here, I'm interested in the safety. Um, uh, you mentioned that you know, the, the logic is now flipped and the state now has a positive duty to maintain or create a secularist environment. What then is the limiting principle, if any? Would, would it be the, would the other clauses, the, would, would the permissive norms now then be flipped and uh, turn into limiting principles? Or? Uh, no. uh, because the, I accept the existence of the permissive norms, right? uh, and I view them as exceptions, meaning that I accept them as a given, and as a given, I will simply strictly construe them without eliminating them. Uh, what I will say simply is that because I am committed to secularism as an organizing principle, and I accept the existence of these permissive norms, right? Uh, uh, I will apply them given the constraints of the hierarchy that I have created. Right? Uh, that in case of doubt as to the interpretation of the um, the permissive norms, I will go for a more secular understanding without totally eliminating the permissive norm. Uh, when it comes also to the safety, I think the safety will be addressed to the judges. Right? Uh, this is just a theory. Right? Uh, the theory does not self-implement. Right? Uh, it's not self-implementing. Uh, the theory is a tool for interpretation, and so you will need for be for you to be able to see the full powers of the theory, right? Uh, uh, judges or justices who are willing, right, uh, to accept the uh, the limited assumptions of the theory. And I think once you accept the limited assumptions of the theory, it's very easy to accept it as a logical framework for uh, providing a coherent understanding of all the clauses. Of course, if you're not interested in a coherent understanding of the clauses, if you think that the best way to interpret the clauses is as, as separate parcels of norms, right? uh, not under a general framework, then this theory is not for you. The theory is for judges who are interested uh, in a very general framework, right? uh, in logical coherence and comprehensive understanding, which I think should be a goal for judges because they have to rationalize their decisions. Uh, I just want to clarify one of the points in your theory because uh, I think one of the critical points in that theory is is the conversion between uh, the conversion from from the language of Article Three. Uh, which is really, uh, as we said, the traditional understanding is a right-based negative proposition to one that is uh, to one that is which imposes a positive obligation or duty on the part of the state. Uh, but uh, we must admit that we cannot really do away with the with the language with the text of Article Three, which really yes, yes. creates a right holder. Yes. Uh, I just want to see how. How how we can uh, uh, connect the these two concepts? Because on the one hand we have we we we, we ensure constitutionally some people uh, to exercise their faith, but on the at the at the other uh, at the same time the state has an obligation to to make, perhaps filter those views in a way that privileges reason. So what uh, it's a it's a it's a very contentious point. Uh, I will I can provide a specific example. Uh, there are uh, certain sects uh, which prohibit their children from getting blood transfusions from uh, uh, I think non-members of the family, right? Uh, right. Um, and if you follow 
the jurisprudence, right? uh, you can make the argument in favor of uh, free exercise in the sense that you know uh, uh, the parents right, uh, have control over their children and they have uh, you know uh, the exclusivity in the understanding of uh, blood right, uh, is an integral of not or not if not central part of that religious understanding. Uh, a secularist understanding would uh, would take into consideration that kind of an argument and see it as an important argument, but balance it with, number one, the constitutional obligation of the parents to become, uh, to be responsible parents. And so, uh, if you look at the Article 14 provision, it refers not only to the constitutional right of parents to rear their children in accordance with their religious beliefs, but also with the demands of responsible parenthood. Right. Uh, I will also see the right of parents to uh, not only to indoctrinate their children in the tenets of their faith, as well as to use their religion uh, when it comes to the health, right, uh, physical health of their children, as a violation of the right of parents to be the stewards, right, uh, uh, of their children. I see parents not as owners of chapel children, right, uh, but as stewards tasked with a what an almost sacred obligation to prepare their children for responsible citizenship, right, uh, and so I will try to use the secularism principle to find ways to balance, you know, uh, the religious claim, and I think. Uh, a rule or a decision that says that parents cannot impose their religious views to the physical detriment of their children would be a rational decision. session is a joy. Uh, well, thank you for, for, oh, there's another question. Hi, sir. I have two questions. One is that, um, would you say that the separation between church and state is important because mainly the church disables the state? And if so, would our total dissolution of the constitutional recognition to the religious clauses of the church be better? Uh, well, the, the theory is is an internal theory, meaning it accepts the existing provisions of the Constitution as a given. Uh, like I said, it is a descriptive theory of the clauses. It's not a normative theory in the sense that I am arguing for the elimination of those clauses. But, uh, but if you ask me as a, as a constitutional matter, is it better for us to eliminate those clauses, I'd say no. Uh, because, uh, you know, secularism, simply is a guarantee of the creation of a public space. Right? Uh, it's, not, it's not a state-mandated destruction of organized religion. Right? Uh, at some level, I think you have to recognize the importance of and the power of the kind of meaning that is generated by religious beliefs. Right? Uh, and, and I think that's really very important. Right? Uh, it's just that. You know, uh, uh, even if I do recognize the, the power and the force of the meaning generated by religious belief, right, uh, uh, at some point, the only, we have to accept as well that the only way for us to rationally create policy right, uh, is through rational argument, right, uh, is through the use of reason. Because once we start using non-rational justifications in the public space, the conversation is over. Right? Uh, there's no point in talking to someone who is not open to uh, a rational debate. Right? Uh, and so uh, you can be as non-rational, as irrational as can be to in the private sphere. Right? Uh, although I wouldn't consider that as an absolute as well. Right? Uh, uh, what I would say simply is that you know, uh, in the public sphere, there should be a heightened concern for uh, the need to privilege reason over non-reason. 
simply that. Not an elimination of you know, uh, religion as a source of meaning. Right? Uh, I mean, because you, you have to give it to uh, organized and non-organized religion. Uh, it is really such a powerful way to uh, transcend everything. Right? Uh, and that is, I think, is uh, uh, entitled to a lot of respect, you know, even guarded respect. Yes. The preference for secular reason over religious the epistemological preference yes. is constitutionally ordained. Yes. I mean, we accept it as the starting point. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to be sure. Yes. Uh, yes, it is the starting point because it is what is in the Constitution, right? Uh, and so for me, all constitutional conversations about the relationship between church and state begins with the premise that the constitutional order right, uh, is tilted towards secularism because it is an organizing principle. It is not just one brick in, in, in a house, right? Uh, it is an ingredient you know, in all the bricks in that particular house. Thank you. Is there any other question? Okay, so, search food. Yes, uh, <laughs> I don't even lunch, actually. I so thank you up. for coming to, to this enriching uh, Thank challenge. you and good afternoon.